Hey friends, welcome to the Make Life Matter podcast. I'm Angela Donatio, and each week I share compelling conversations with leading voices. They encourage us to ground our worth in the word instead of the narrative of the world. Together we'll make our lives matter no matter what. Here's this week's episode. Well, hey guys, welcome back to the podcast. We are right in the thick of season six. It's already been so amazing. So many diverse conversations and compelling conversations with leading voices right here on the Make Life Matter podcast. And that's just going to get even better today. I'm so excited to sit down with Pastor Steve Jameson. He grew up fishing the treacherous waters off the coast of Alaska. And if you know me well, you know my husband was raised in Alaska. We're going to talk about that in just a minute. And that is true. It is a treacherous um, situation sometimes up there, deep sea fishing and all the things that are happening in Alaska. And that was both thrilling and full of adventure for him. And it was in the thick of those adventures when he heard the voice of God for the first time, calling him into ministry. And he realized that there's no greater thrill than discovering God's calling on your life. And we're going to talk about what it feels like and what it is to hear the voice of God. We don't want you to feel stuck, confused. We want you to have practical handles to hold on to, to know with confidence that you're hearing from God. And through his new book, The Most Valuable Catch, risking it all for what matters the most. He is the pastor of Eastridge Church in Seattle, Washington. So Steve Jamison is going to help us know how to hear God's voice, how to equip us with the tools and real life principles to help us know God's prompts and to find our own purpose. We're also even going to talk about some other things like what do we do when we know someone's wandering from God? What do we do uh, to make sure we're leaving a legacy? So Pastor Steve is a wealth of information, and we're just going to dive right in. So welcome, Pastor Steve. I'm so honored and excited to have you here on the Make Life Matter podcast. Oh, Angela, it's, it's my privilege. It's my joy. I, I love what you're doing. I love your your whole theme of Make Life Matter and uh, some of the guests you've had have been just amazing. So thank you for having me today. Oh, thank you, Pastor. It's my joy. So right off the bat, you grew up in, or I don't know if you grew up in Alaska, but I know that you were there fishing. That's where the Lord kind of encountered you. You have this profound experience that we'll talk about in a minute. But talk about Alaska. My husband was born and raised there. And yeah. uh, his dad pastored churches all over in some very remote places, Fort Yukon, Toke, um, oh, eventually yeah. in Eagle River. But Okay. A barrow, some, you know, some of the places you have to get to by plane. So I understand yeah. the whole treacherous. He lived there for, you know, 18, 20 years of his life. So talk about that. That is yeah. a unique experience that you've had, and it really shaped you profoundly. Yeah. You know, I grew up in kind of an interesting situation because uh, my mother and father were both first generation Christians. Neither one of them were raised with any kind of faith background. Hmm. My mother actually grew up in an alcoholic home, endured a lot of pain. So when they first came to the Lord and found each other, uh, they really decided they wanted to build a family that would walk in the precepts of God. And so they really started down that road. But my dad was a commercial fisherman. Hmm. And so my story kind of goes way back because the first time he ever took me to sea, and I'm not talking about like just going for a trip. Uh, he took me out albacore uh, tuna fishing and he would fish all up and down the West coast. Mm -hmm. And our trips, uh, tuna fishing is a two man crew. In our case, it became my dad and myself. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, as a young kid, all through my teenage years, I would be at sea the whole summer long. And we would be out on a trip 30 days. The longest trip was 40 days at sea without seeing land, which is the two of us. Mm. And uh, so I had to kind of earn my wings tuna fishing. Mm. And then when he had confidence that I was ready for it, because it's a totally different level going to Alaska. And in Alaska, we we're fishing on a five-man crew. The boat fished 24 hours a day. As a crew member, you were on deck 20 hours a day. So it was an all-out mm. push. And um, I love Alaska. If any of your listeners get a chance to ever you know, if it's kind of a bucket list, you should go. Uh, mm -hmm. It's an, you know, one of the most beautiful places in the world. So much to offer, so diverse. Mm -hmm. And it's just an amazing thing. But I was in Alaska and, you know, normally um, just think about this. When I was a young teenage kid uh, fishing in Alaska, our boat, we did well. And so a lot of times I was making as much money as a teenager fishing the summer as some of my friend's parents were making working, you know, all year long. Mm. And uh, so, you know, one of the things about fishing is 
that if you're if you're not catching fish, uh, the crew is responsible for the for the expenses. So mm -hmm. you could go out, work your tail off, risk your life. And if things went bad, you could actually end up owing money at the end of the time. Oh, wow. And so we we're on one of these trips and bad weather. And it was just different. Uh, normally, we did very well. This time, we were pulling up just empty hooks. And um, so my dad made a dramatic decision. He's like, you know what? We're going to keep all the gear on the boat. We're going to travel for 12 hours or so. And we're going to just try a different spot, see if we can salvage this trip. So the only benefit of that moment was where we'd all been on deck, just knocking ourselves out. It only took one guy to pilot the boat to be on wheel watch. And the rest of us could take a turn and get some real sleep. And I want to be really careful for our listeners because what I'm going to tell you is, a, a, you know, a unique moment in my life. It's not like I wait for God to speak to me through a dream or through these things. Uh, I'd love to talk, uh, you know, as we go on about how God does speak to us in these various ways. But in this particular moment, God gave me uh, an incredible encounter. I fell asleep. I, I got up in my bunk in the midst of these rough seas. I packed myself in with life jackets and just to keep from getting pitched out. And mm -hmm. I, I fell immediately asleep because you're so exhausted. And I had a dream. And in this dream, I was in a very nondescript place. I couldn't tell you if it was a large high school or if it was a small college, but there was, I was out on a stage uh, in a small grandstand and I was preaching and people started coming out of the grandstand. They crossed kind of a cinder rock, came into this infield type of area uh, to make a commitment to follow Christ. And I woke up. And so the question is, you know, how do you distinguish a random dream mm -hmm. uh, from God speaking to you? And I think the answer to that is only you will know that in the moment. Mm -hmm. and, and in this moment, I knew that this was an encounter. I never thought about being a pastor, never thought about preaching. It was kind of the last thing on my agenda. And yet I knew that this was a, you know, a profound encounter. Mm -hmm. And so I did what I think a lot of guys would do. Um, I was still in my bunk and I started negotiating with God. I was like, Oh God, <laughs> you know, if you really want me to change my direction yeah. and, and go this way, uh, something's got to change because I'm, I'm not making any money now and to go to college, you know, change my direction. Mm -hmm. And it was like, the Lord said, money, is that it? Is that what determines whether mm -hmm. you serve me or not? Mm -hmm. And uh, God was like, I can handle, I can handle money. Mm -hmm. And just a little while after that, I could feel the boat slowing down. Normally we would never even eat together as crew members because they didn't want you wasting the time that, you know, you would shoot the breeze over lunch or dinner. You just went in, ate, got back out. And, but in this case, we'd all been, like I said, sleeping, the boat had been running. And, um, and so we were going to have breakfast together and then go hit this thing. And I'm, re I'm fishing with some guys who are retired Navy commanders. I mean, uh, I'm in a, quite an environment with these guys and, and I came out and they're, you know, th their bodies ache, they're tired and they're, the, the morale is pretty low. And I came out there and I'm like, Hey, you know what? Today, things are going to change. We're going to nail them today. Mm -hmm. And they're like, Oh yeah, kid, you know, what makes you so sure? And I didn't pull a Joseph. I didn't tell him I had a dream. <laughs> uh, I just said, Hey, I think things are going to change. Mm -hmm. And the reality is when we started dropping our gear, we started catching fish mm -hmm. like I had never seen before. And, um, we not only caught up our expenses, uh, but we loaded the boat and, um, so my story is I wish I could tell you that that settled everything for me, but it didn't. I, I went on three more trips during that summer. And by the time I got home, I had just pushed that out to the furthest from my heart. Mm -hmm. And I went back to chasing what I thought, you know, I was on a different path to be a business lawyer and, you know, go that way. Mm -hmm. And so when I got back, I, I did what a young guy would do. I bought a motorcycle. I bought a new car. Um, I actually bought an, a duplex right off the beach uh, before it was even finished. And um, and then I moved in with a couple of my unsaved buddies and I would go to church and on the weekends I would hear my pastor. And it didn't matter what he was preaching on. I only heard one message. You're out of the will of God. What are you doing here? Mm -hmm. And so I told the Lord, God, if you'll just show me one more time that you really spoke to me, mm -hmm. I will follow you. And I drove 10 minutes from the church to this place, at, you know, this duplex. And I was just getting out of my car. And one of my, one of my buddies who didn't know the Lord walks over to me 
And he says, Hey, I've been thinking about you. And I, I thought this is crazy. And I said, what have you been thinking about Mike? And he said, I've been thinking about what you should do with your life. Hmm. And so I just smarted off to him. I said, yeah, Mike, what should I do with my life? Mm -hmm. And he said, I think you should be a preacher. Mm -hmm. And I, I just about fell over, you know, I said, what made you say that? And uh, he said, I don't know. I just felt like it's on my mind. I had to tell you. And um, I think you'd be a good one. Mm -hmm. And I got out of my car. I went upstairs, got in my room and I literally got on my knees and I just mm -hmm. confessed my rebellious heart. And the next day, um, you know, I, I, you know, my youth pastor had taken me from time to time to Northwest, which is a Christian school out in the Sierra, Seattle area. Well, anyhow, that next day I called and I enrolled myself because I didn't want to give myself one mm -hmm. inch mm -hmm. to back up on what I knew God was, you know, dealing with me. Yeah. And so that was the opening of, of, uh, kind of my adventure in Alaska, you know, my background fishing with my dad, but the Lord really calling me to a different mm -hmm. direction in my life. Wow. Wow. There's so many wonderful things here to lean into how we hear from the Lord and, and how we delay sometimes we've all had that happen. We hear from God, we know we did. And then we just kind of put it in the back of our mind. We go back to normal. Um, even of course, so much about Peter, as you were talking to my mind when they couldn't catch anything and they're up yeah. all night and then they encountered Jesus. And then it's more than they could contain. And then even after the death and resurrection of Jesus, Peter went back to what he knew. It's just our That's instinct. Exactly right. So, yeah. you know, it's nothing that we need to, we need to understand that can be our temptation. It can be our instinct. So rather than act like, well, that's only me, maybe something's wrong with me to, to just realize that can be our temptation, but to release that to the Lord, understand maybe what fear is underneath that or other priorities. I mean, you're a, a, basically a teenager too. That's a hard thing to feel like my whole yeah. direction is going to change. Yeah. My husband was going to be a lawyer. He actually, when his undergrad was in pre-law and he had his sights on being a Senator and uh, having grown up on the mission field, he just, he really wanted something different and he was fighting it. And, uh, he was taking his, you know, LSATs, getting into law schools and just feeling so much discontent and restlessness. And he said to his dad, Oh, I feel like maybe I'm supposed to go in the ministry. And his dad said, listen, if you can do anything else, but ministry and be fulfilled then do it. But if you're if you're truly called to the ministry, you're never going to be fulfilled doing anything else. So he went back and got his master's of divinity and we've been in the ministry ever since. So, you know, those, sometimes it takes those dramatic encounters because left on our own, we will continue just to pursue what's comfortable or what's familiar. And God interrupted what was familiar to you to kind of completely redirect your life. And uh, the rest is really history. It's still being written. Yeah. You went on to be an evangelist, by the way, we're going to talk about the book and hearing from God and um, guys, some of those principles that he just mentioned. So hang on to that for a moment. But I want to just mention you have preached as an evangelist in six continents. So yes. the Lord really mm -hmm. took you all over the world. Now you're pastoring, you have a church in Ethiopia, you pastor a, a wonderful church fellowship. So Talk to us about kind of what it was like to minister. I'm an adventure junkie. It's literally in my bio, Pastor. So, you know, we, we're cut out of the same cloth. And yeah. I think I used to feel like sometimes maybe that was indulgent or selfish. And then I realized the Lord hardwired me for kind of that need. And now it's something that has been used for kingdom purpose, leading teams internationally. Uh, I'll spend almost three months overseas this year. So you got to have kind of that bent toward you to want to travel and be overseas. So talk about that for a minute. I, I, I love that in, in you and in your husband, you know, Thank it's, you. um, you know, faith is the substance of things that are hoped for, not the things that are seen. Mm. Um, sometimes I'll talk to people about why Jesus, you know, maybe even selected fishermen, uh, because you've got to be a visionary. You have to believe mm -hmm. that something, you know, is big in return or you would never, in one of my chapters is talking about untying and heading to deeper water, you know, yes. the great things of life, you know, if you're willing to just stay in the safe spot of the harbor, you're going to, you're going to miss out mm -hmm. on, on the great adventure of life. And one of the things, you know, today we need more people going into mm -hmm. full-time ministry. Yes. And I think one of the hindrances is that people don't understand Yes, ministry has a lot of demands. It can sometimes be a very, quote unquote, thankless job. Uh, and yet at the same time, 
it is such a life of adventure. It is such a life of, of watching God open doors that you could have never imagined mm. and just watching, you know, faith works like a, you know, dominoes. It's like, it's when one, one moves, the others begin to move. So and, um, you know, I told you about how, when the Lord gave me this encounter, there's so much behind it. You know, I, I was just going in getting tight in knots and, and I learned how God deals with people. You know, I'll preach sometimes and I'll say, you may feel like you're the only person here because God's just dealing with you. And it's because I knew that own experience myself, sure, you know, sure. and I even gone in and I talked to my pastor about, you know, as a young guy, this is churning in me, you know, mm -hmm. and he would just say, you know, you just got to come to that place where you're willing to move because it's easier to steer a car when it's moving. <laughs> so when I finally came to that place where even my, my roommate spoke something to me that you would never imagine, mm. that's why I just knew, okay, I've got to act upon this. And I also thought going to Bible college was the end of all fun. You know, that's, mm -hmm. I really thought that. And it was the absolute opposite. I met my wife there. Uh, some of my best friends that I've done ministry with for decades now. Um, you know, it's, it's an amazing life. I want to encourage people, not just that you have to go out in what we call full-time ministry because everybody who follows Absolutely. Jesus mm -hmm. is in full-time ministry, right? That's right? But not to fear that place of total surrender and, yeah. and chasing those dreams. And I'll tell you one little piece too. Years later, um, I was preaching in Seattle in what is today called T-Mobile Park. I was just uh, there the other night with the Seattle Mariners playing. Mm. And, um, uh, you know, back in this moment, it was called Safeco Field. And, um, I was doing an event there and there was a stage across second base. And I was preaching in this, you know, major league baseball stadium it has a retractable roof. It's an incredible building. And as I was preaching, I came to the altar call and I'm standing there. I'm really kind of just doing my job. You know what I mean? I'm just doing my job. And people are coming out of the grandstands and they're walking out of the grandstands and they're coming over the top of this cinder rock, first base mm -hmm. and third base lines. Mm -hmm. And they're coming to the center and I'm standing there on that platform. And it was like the Holy Spirit said, wait a minute. Yeah. Don't miss what's right in front of you. Wow. And I, and I just stood there and I went, wow, you know, God, you didn't say, um, you didn't show me this grand thing. You didn't say, follow me and you're going to preach in a major leagues yeah. uh, uh, stadium. Uh, you know, we've done events in Madison Square Garden. You, you name different NBA yeah. arenas and it's not about the arena. It's not about the place. It's mm -hmm. about the people that God touches and, and not only the people he touches, but this incredible journey that he does in our faith walk, mm -hmm. you know, putting our lives on the line. Uh, you know, doing things, you know, your church plant, you know, you're going to Africa, you're going to different continents. We were taking a step of faith with no safety net. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we, it was our house that was on the line if, if an event mm -hmm. went wrong, you know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. And uh, so there's nothing better in our lives than <laughs> just living all full out, you know, full on. And I agree. It's a, I call it the grandest adventure at all of all people that think serving the Lord is boring. I, it, there's nothing boring about it. I think the most yeah. exhilarating thing is hearing from the Holy Spirit. Now, does right. that not mean there might be some fear that comes in or the, you got to assess what he's asking you to do and all of those things. But that is that that's the thrilling part of serving the Lord is knowing that he wants to use us. People are his mission. That's so right. Whether it's you're listening and you're in the line at target or Chick-fil-A or you're yeah. somewhere in another continent. The, the point that Pastor Steve is making is obedience and surrender is what is success in the kingdom. Not, yeah. well, I may never preach at Madison Square Garden. That might be your assignment. It might not. But, yeah. you know, agenda is up to God, but assignment is up to us. And we've just got to be obedient to do what he's asking us to do. And then trust it's going to be an adventure. If you can do it by yourself, you wouldn't need God. So he's he's looking for people who will say yes to whatever he's asking. It might feel small to you listening, but it might not be small in the kingdom of God. It could be huge. So uh, just do what he's asking you to do. It's going to be extraordinary. I have to ask, what's the one continent you've never been on? Oh, well, it's Antarctica. I'm, I know, I'm, right? Nobody goes. There. I mean, how uh, do you get all seven in because of that? I know. I know. I've been to Argentina and, okay. you know, they've invited me to come back and they're like, hey, if you want to go to 
you know, Antarctica, we can figure that out. But I don't want to go somewhere just to go there. I want to make no, sure that it's got kingdom, kingdom purpose. Agreed. And agreed. So, Selfishly, uh, I'd love to, to, <laughs> to be on all seven continents and I'm yeah. getting, I'm getting there. But like yeah. you said, it's more crucial, um, to just follow what the Lord, cause that's where the fruit is going to be and fruit that remains. You know, we could do a lot of things in life. So we've got to be able to narrow even one of my early trips to Africa. I've been a couple dozen times now, but in that early trips, you just feel overwhelmed by the need. You could just yeah. be throwing jello on the wall and go in a million directions. You really got to hear from God or else you'll kind of feel like you're wandering and re- you'll either be doing nothing or you'll be trying to do everything. And neither yes. one of those are a healthy alternative. So let's talk about hearing from God. It's a kind of a, a great segue. Um, we know God captured your attention in Alaska. He shifted the direction of your life. But let's talk for a minute about what it feels like. You talk about these prompts, Pastor, yeah. that we hear um, to to hear God's voice, to know we're hearing God's voice. That's a, That can be a difficult thing for people to identify and understand. So talk us through some of that. Yeah, you know, I, I want to, this, this is why I like to be so careful with people that they don't have any idea that something, you know, is significant because it's big or because it's, you know, in the public eye. Yes. Um, God works through what you've just talked about. Faith and obedience is not only what opens up the doors of what God does, but those steps of faith and obedience is what even fine tunes our ear mm. to hear the voice of God. And so I always tell people this. Yes, I had a dramatic moment and you may have your own dramatic moment, but don't wait or look for God to speak to you exactly like he did somebody else. Mm. And the most important thing is to realize that God is not a distant God. He's not a God that made us and walked away from us. He did the opposite. He shaped us and formed us unique out of all of creation to be able to have a real relationship with him where he could put his imprint upon our heart and our lives. Mm. And the ultimate is that we could know that he loves us and that he, he wants real relationship and you can't have a great relationship with anyone. You can't have a, a marriage. You can't have a friendship. You can't have a business partnership where you're not able to communicate without communication. There is no relationship. Mm. So a lot of people say, I don't know if God speaks to me. The answer is yes, he does. You've just got to stop and start to really listen and maybe even quiet your fears or your doubts a little bit so you can actually hear God. But the number one way that God speaks to us, and it's what I call the protective confines of the word of God. Amen. You know, you'll you'll bump into people that want you to think this way, believe this or do that. And you don't need a, a strange, wild religious experience. You need an experience rooted in the word of God. Amen. And I always say, if it's in the, if it's in the word, we want it. If it's not, we don't, we don't <laughs> want to go there. So the word of God, I love Hebrews four, where it talks about how the word of God is alive and it's active. Mm. It's powerful that it cuts down deep, even into the bone and the marrow, rightfully dividing the thoughts and the attitudes mm. of a person's heart. It's been said, it's important for you to know the word but it's also important for you to know the word knows you. Yes. And and so when you get in and you start studying the word, I always tell people one of the best things that I learned is to read the Bible with purpose. Mm. And I like to study one book at a time. But even if you've got things on your heart, search God with that topic. Like if you're saying, God, I hurt. Okay, go read, you know, pick your New Testament books and 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 just start to read with you know, your phone or your pad close by and just say, Lord, I want you to show me how you heal hurts or how you deal with a broken, hurting heart. And it will just pop off the page, right? Yeah. If you need direction, God, how do you show people direction? Boom, boom. You'll, you'll be stunned mm. when you read with purpose, how the word will come alive. The other thing that the word will do is if you're struggling with moral you know, issues and should I, be, you know, is this the right relationship? Is this the right situation? You can have people affirm anything in your life, any, mm. you know, you can find somebody to affirm any kind of behavior, but that's not what's going to make you fulfilled or happy or, okay. or fulfill the destiny of God. The word brings that to you. Mm. Another aspect is I always encourage people with worship. I believe worship is a gateway mm. to God 
pouring into your heart and soul. There's this amazing exchange as you, as we give God glory and honor and open up our hearts, he pours back into us and he affirms, he affirms his touch and his love for us. Mm. Another thing, just like I talked about going to my pastor when I was wrestling, Mm -hmm. you know, godly counsel, you know, the Bible speaks Psalm one, don't take the counsel of the ungodly. Mm -hmm. So I always, I always say we should be friends with everybody, have all kinds of friendships, but be very selective with who you allow to speak into your, into your heart, you know, make sure there are people who are walking with God. Cause if you're wanting to hear God's voice, now I told you, uh, God used an unbeliever to, deliver part of my message and they can do that. But when you're seeking your moral values and your direction, I really encourage, uh, really be careful about, you know, your friends. Mm. And so there's a lot of ways God can speak to us. He can awaken us. You talk about Alaska Mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, I mean, I've seen so many beautiful things in Alaska from, Mm -hmm. you know, Mount, you know, the Denali's and I mean, just uh, humpback whales, breaching out of the water in the morning, you know, just spectacular things that make you stop. Yeah. Probably nothing greater than the birth of a baby though, to see mm. uh, the miracle of life. And God mm. can stop you in your tracks and remind you that there's something bigger to live for than just your opinion. Mm-hmm. That's so good. Pastor Steve, again, there's so much great stuff there. The word of God is our ultimate source of knowing we're hearing from God. That is yes. the word. People will say, I need a word. Well, you have a word. It's called the Bible. So start there. And, uh, and, and God will never tell you to do something that contradicts his word. So that's exactly. our first, you know, vetting source right there. And then, like you said, we don't want to build a theology based on experience, but God will use experiences to confirm his word, his, his intent for our lives. And then it's so good to, to, run that through your pastor, run that through godly counsel. I mean, we know people that, oh, I'm called to the ministry and they quit their job a week later. Like maybe your timing is off. Maybe the, you've heard from God, even in the new Testament, we have examples of, of like one of the prophets that, you know, Paul gives this, I, you know, I'm going to be going here and this is going to happen to me. And the, the the prophet has the right information, but the wrong interpretation. So we can hear from God and still misinterpret what our, next step should be. And so surrendering even our agenda to that, sometimes we don't that's want right. accountability because we don't want someone to tell us, I don't think that's the right person for you. Or I don't think this is God's timing. Mean, we have to constantly stay in that posture of humility. There's two things I wanted to lean into for a second there, pastor. I was a worship pastor for 20 years, so I could okay. not agree more that worship is that gateway because When you're really worshiping, if you look through scripture, you can't have worship without an altar. So, you know, the New Testament says we are basically the altar. We're presenting our lives as a living sacrifice. That that posture of surrender and obedience that happens in worship, when you really lean into that place, then you're more willing to receive whatever God's will is for you. Sometimes it's a yes. Sometimes it's a no. I get irritated pastor. Maybe I don't know if it bothers you when people say, I'm just not hearing from God. He's not answering me. Well, he, he might be answering you and you don't like his answer. So yeah. that's doesn't mean he's not answering. Like a, a no is still an answer. A not yet is still an answer, but he always has our best interest at heart. Yes. So the point of knowing his word is not just to know a list of do's and don'ts, but it's to know his character Yes. so that we can trust his answers and trust his character, even if we don't understand, you know, what's happening in life. So guys, if you're listening, go back through and listen to that section again, that there was so much. And honestly, it's just lifting from the book. I want you to get a copy of the book. I don't want to tell everything about the book here, pastor, because I wanted them to get a copy. It is the most valuable catch, risking it all for what matters the most. And, uh, and we were talking earlier, pastor, men are reading the book. Women are reading the book. Yeah. It's, it's great for anybody. I co-wrote a book with my dad and I loved it to see both men and women yes. reading it. I want to talk about one of the threads that's in your book, because I always close with a question, but I want to move it up okay? because I believe your answer to this will probably be, um, one and the same, but you have a, a thread throughout the book of, of the life of Barnabas and really um, the importance of him in his life with Paul. And he's, he's what I call the supporting actors in the Bible, but but sadly he really isn't a supporting actor. He's, he's a lead actor in his own way, 
But talk about him because one of the questions I love to ask here is other than Jesus, who has most inspired you to make life matter? But Barnabas has meant a lot to you. Why is that the case? And what can we learn from his life? I love this because, um, you know, I think sometimes people uh, undervalue what God could do with their lives. Mm. They they think if I'm not, you know, if I don't look like this, or if I don't, you know, have this type of a ministry, I just don't know if I'm significant or if I really can make a difference. Mm. And I want to challenge every person to know that you were made for this. You were made for this living dynamic relationship with the Lord. Mm. And he wants to speak into your life yes. and he will do it. Maybe sometimes in grand ways, other times, you know, like the Bible speaks about with Elijah, the still small voice, just that interior voice. I call it mm. the prompt. In mm. fact, I, the, the book was almost named the prompt because mm. that's how much I, I think about this concept. Okay. So I, I look into Acts chapter four. Here's why Barnabas is significant. The early church is taking form. It has incredible needs. It's just, you know, it's just taking off. Yeah. And, and here's this interesting dynamic because the Bible introduces this man named Joseph. And it says that Joseph was a Levite from Cyprus and that he had a piece of land that he sold. Well, normally Levites weren't allowed to have land. So right. even scholars today wonder what happened here. Take that aside. The most important thing is that there was just a prompt into the heart of Joseph. And I think the heart was this. The church has needs. Yes. And he's like, how can I help? What can I do? And the Lord just says, you know what? You got that piece of land. Mm -hmm. You could sell that land and you could contribute that. Mm -hmm. And there's, you're a pastor, your husband, you know, you pastor, you and I know there are people in our lives you could point to who blow wind into the sails of you yeah. as a leader, right? Yeah. And there's others that are a drain, just, mm -hmm. you know, and, and here's, here's what happens with Joseph. Joseph sells the piece of land and he takes the, the resource and he lays it at the apostles feet seems insignificant, but it's so powerful. So profound mm -hmm. because you and I know when you're dreaming the big dreams and you're leaning in and you're asking God, how are we going to do this? How will the ends ever meet mm -hmm. when God sends somebody to, you're not just paying bills. You're blowing wind into the sails of a warrior and and Joseph comes and lays the the resource at the feet of the apostles and what he's saying there is not only here's resource to help meet these physical needs but he's communicating i trust you mm -hmm. i trust you as my leader i trust your stewardship mm -hmm. i just want to be a part of what god is about to do mm -hmm. if we had a, a a revival of that attitude the world would be changed mm -hmm. and the, that brought such encouragement to these early church leaders under so much pressure yes. that they changed his name. They said, mm -hmm. we can't even see this guy as Joseph anymore. When he walks in, man, encouragement comes with him. Mm -hmm. So they changed his name to Barnabas yeah. and the son of encouragement. Now, when you look at the New Testament, I think you're going to see it through a totally different lens. Because what the Bible teaches us is that God encounters a man named Saul on the road to Damascus. And, you know, obviously Jesus reveals himself. There's another man named Ananias that goes. But then uh, Saul goes off and he preaches. And then the Lord says, I want you to go to Jerusalem and meet the apostles. Mm -hmm. So he comes to Jerusalem in Acts chapter 9. And here are the men. Think about this. This is These are the apostles. These are right. not just the insignificant fringe. These are the men of faith and power, right? Leading the church, signs, wonders, miracles. But none of them have discernment to see that Saul is for real. Right. And none, none of them have the faith or the courage to go and even encounter him. Right. One guy, mm -hmm. Barnabas, is willing to take the prompt of the spirit that says, wait a minute, there's something God's doing in that man's life. Mm -hmm. You need to hear him out. And Barnabas goes out and meets Saul and brings him in, risk his life. Saul was the leading persecutor of the church. Mm. Stephen, others lost their lives because of Saul's influence. Right. Barnabas brings him in and vouches for him, introduces him 
to the apostles. Think about it. Would we even know the apostle Paul today Mm -hmm. if it wasn't for the guy who is not the headliner, but Mm -hmm. the faithful guy doing what God prompted him to do in the moment? Mm -hmm. And here's what I think is so significant for all of the, the listeners. God prompts you. These divine moments are all around you. And this is what I'm saying, like the, the moment of faith and obedience is what God uses to open that next door. Um, if you got a moment, let me, t- can I take this a little further? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So um, a revival breaks out, a move of God breaks out in Antioch and, um, and the apostles hear about it. And they're asking the question in Acts 11, who should we send to Antioch? Right. And they're like, well, the number one guy would be Barnabas. Mm. He could encourage them. So they send Barnabas to Antioch Mm. and Barnabas is there and he's, you know, as leaders, you know how this is. You, you earn, you, you win the love of the people. You, he was their teacher. He was their inspiration. Yes. He could have just been the guy. Okay. He could have been the guy, but there's that prompt again. Mm. And the Holy spirit prompts him and says, you know what? There's someone else that needs to be here. Mm. Paul needs to be here. Mm. And so Barnabas walks over a hundred miles to go to Tarsus, no cell phone, nothing. You know, how do you know he's even still there? He took Mm. a chance and he went there and he lobbied and encouraged Paul to come with him to Antioch. Mm. And so Paul goes with Barnabas to Antioch and they teach and preach together. So Mm. here's one thing that's big in my life. I want to be the kind of person that opens space for other people to grow in their dreams, yes. to grow in their skills and their capacity. And, you know, today we need people who will, one of the, one of the aspects of my book is about shared leadership yes. and, and this opportunity. It's right here in front of us. Think about Barnabas. He shared the preaching. He shared the affection of the people. Mm. And uh, out of that comes Acts 13 where the Holy Spirit speaks, separate Paul and Barnabas for the work I've called them to. Mm. And now they go out on the first missionary journey and Mm. they begin to be the church planters and spreading the message of the New Testament. And then you fast forward to Acts 15, when it becomes time where the apostle Paul says to Barnabas, let's go back. Let's go revisit all these churches that we planted. Well, on that first missionary journey, they had John Mark with them. Right. And we don't know why fear, whatever it might've been. But at one point, John Mark abandoned them Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, you know, it left a mark on Paul. And so when Paul says, let's go for a second journey, Barnabas says, okay, let's do it, but let's take John Mark. Mm -hmm. And Paul says, no. Mm -hmm. And this is, this start, this is a startling moment of, Mm -hmm. of, of the Bible for me, Mm -hmm. because think about Barnabas. Barnabas is a son of encouragement. He's the guy that gave people the second chance. Mm. He went out and believed in Paul when nobody else believed in Paul. Mm. Now, John Mark is a young guy who knows he's failed along the way. Mm. He's lost their confidence, but Barnabas isn't willing to let go of him because of a failure. And, and what's interesting is Paul was not able to muster in this moment, the same grace for John Mark that Barnabas gave him. Right. And Barnabas would not let go of it. So the Bible says they had a strong dispute and they went their separate ways. Hmm. So here's what I think happened. I'm just speculating. I want everybody, all the audience to know I'm speculating. (laughs) But I think that when Barnabas held to his conviction that he wasn't going to let John Mark be a casualty of ministry, Hmm. you know, made a mistake never to be seen again. Yes. He gave him that grace and that compassion and mentoring. And he held to his convictions and he gave John Mark the same treatment he gave Paul. Yeah. And I just speculate that when John Mark walked away and held to his conviction and Paul saw the back of his head, mm-hmm. that it brought conviction into Paul. Mm-hmm. Because when Paul goes from that moment forward in the New Testament, what does he become known for? He becomes known for being a mentor yeah. to young to young leaders. Right. And he watches them struggle, but he challenges them and puts them into the fire. He puts them into responsibilities mm-hmm. that were bigger than they were even ready for. Isn't that amazing? It's wonderful. So and that's why end, 
That's and why I love the, the story of Barnabas. I love it. Everybody can be a life. Barnabas. I agree with you. And at the end of Paul's life, he says, go get me John Mark. He's been a help to me. So that's right. We all reserve the right to grow wiser. Whatever, yes. whatever prompted Paul, he was too driven in that moment, whatever it was. I love that you identified there was grace on Barnabas to extend to John Mark. And those are leadership principles there. There are times that people just need more more time to develop. My husband and I are, are are highly invested in training and releasing emerging leaders. And so that yes. means you've got to be committed. That means yeah. sometimes it's messy. I mean, he just got back from El Salvador and took a guy that was in our youth group and he has had a rocky road. I'm not going to lie to you. This, this yeah. guy is now 41, but to see him go on the mission field and have put, persevered through prison, through adversity, through, there are times that God is telling you to stay committed to someone's potential, even when it might not make sense to other people. Now you can be wise about what levels of responsibility you may give when they're going through troubled times or situations. But I wrote about that with my dad about Thomas. And I know we don't have a lot of time to develop this even more, but guys, that's why I want you to get the book. There's leadership principles. There's legacy principles. There's, there's so much in this. But just quickly there, Pastor, you know, Thomas is another one who completely disenfranchises from the apostles. When Jesus appears to them, he's nowhere to be found. So you see that it's very possible to be that engaged, even with as an apostle. I mean, he is with Jesus night and day. And yet when disappointment, doubt, disillusionment comes in, his instinct, like we started this conversation, was to pull back, to return to what's familiar, to, to ignore what just happened in his life. And these apostles seek him out and say, listen, you've missed it. I'm telling you, we've seen Jesus. He's alive. And granted, Thomas wanted more proof. We, we know the whole, (laughs) the whole deal. Go get my book and hear that story. But my point there is we do have some biblical models of what to do when people have either wandered from the faith, left the faith just struggling, or even like you're talking about in Barnabas and John Mark's a case, like if God is telling you to continue to pursue, to continue to invest, collaborate in ministry, you're going to go so much further in the kingdom with shared leadership. The way forward in the kingdom is collaboration. The silo idea is done. So we've got to be thinking, I work across denominational lines. I work with men and women in kingdom purpose. Because that's, this is about the kingdom. This is not about individual ministries. This is about the kingdom. And so what you see in these stories is the kingdom needed to advance. And Paul must have thought in that moment, I'm not sure the vision I have and where John Mark is at. Maybe they, maybe that was necessary for John Mark in that moment as well. We don't know, but I love the fact that we got to see the end of that story. Yes. And in Paul's last moments, he's requesting another another moment with John Mark. So it just it, keeps- it shows it shows a lot because um, you know another aspect of it is uh, the the point being that that it was Barnabas's consistency. Yes, Barnabas lived his character even if it meant separating from from Paul, which mm-hmm. was a very dear friend to him. Yes, and um, and it wasn't that. He wasn't necessarily uh, holding John Mark accountable. Uh, it was just that there was a different method for that mentorship and that's that leadership. True. That's so and true. The, the the other thing, I'm not here to fault Paul. I'm just saying there's interesting twists in the Bible, right? Mm-hmm. And it comes down to our own human, you know, our own human personalities. Yeah. But what you see as an outcome is I think that God speaks to all of us. I mean, we may have a situation where we go, I could have handled that better. Yeah. And and then we take a, a course change. And you think even about the uh, the Macedonian call, Paul had his yes, idea to go it, preach yes. in Asia <clears throat> and God showed him a vision and he did not buck it. You know, mm-hmm. he's like, okay, we're going to go that direction. I think all these places, and then even that sensitivity to a Timothy, to a Titus, mm-hmm. you know, uh, to a Phoebe, to mm-hmm. plant into their lives and, and to give them responsibility and give them opportunity where he was excuse me, really ready to pass the kingdom baton to them. So Mm -hmm. it's amazing how God works in our lives. He does. And we're not, we look at snapshots and our, the media brings us little tiny sound bites. God is 
got the 30,000 foot view. And sometimes we need to step back and say, yeah, in that moment, did I handle that the best? I did the best I could under the circumstances. We all can continue to grow, but it goes back to where we started. We have to hear from God. And there were some words that came to my heart and we'll kind of wrap up with this, but we have to stay aware. Like you said, God is always speaking. We have to stay in a posture of awareness, listening, looking, listening for his voice. Secondly, we have to stay available because he might speak to us. But if, if we don't do what he's prompting us to do, you know, he has to be a little louder the next time it's got to be maybe, in fact, it, it might, his voice might actually get quieter to where we've, we've numbed ourselves, or we have become maybe desensitized to, to what his voice sounds like because we've ignored it um, too many times. Not that he won't keep pursuing, but it's important to stay available. And yes. then it's important to act. And I saw that progression as you were talking earlier, you see these dots that continue to connect. People stay aware, they stay available, and then there's action that follows. And People will see people do things in the kingdom. Oh, I want to be doing those things. I want to be yeah. speaking on six continents. Well, you, you, you're looking at the action. You got to go back to the awareness, the posture, the prayer, the worship, the word, yes. all of those components lead to a life of action. Obedience is going to lead to a life of action. So that's right. <clears throat> I just want to thank you, Pastor, because it's a great book. By the thank time you. this airs, probably in a couple of weeks from today, we're going to get near, believe it or not, a Christmas season. Yes. And I think this is a tremendous Christmas gift, for, especially for a man in your life. It's a masculine somewhat kind of cover and title. Yeah. Not that men aren't reading yeah. it too, but I love the fact that there are books out here for guys. It's a yeah. guy's book. Yeah. If you're watching, you just saw the cover. Um, if you're any kind of sports enthusiast, outdoor enthusiast, um, adventure junkie like me, like yeah. just get it for the man in your life. If you're listening and you're a woman, uh, if you're a pastor or a leader, it's such a great resource. Put it in your library, add it to your library, maybe give it to someone on your staff who you know is growing in their ability to hear from the Lord, the most valuable catch, risking it all, which we've been talking about, what that looked like for Barnabas, risking it to go and and put his life on the line for Paul, for what matters the most. And uh, people matter. The kingdom matters. Let's keep that forefront. So Pastor Steve, where do you want people to go to kind of connect with you? I know I follow you on Instagram and get a copy of the book. You know, it's out on all the platforms, but I would, I would really love to direct people to come directly to our website. Sure. It's the most valuable catch.com. And there we have some, uh, we really view this book as a tool. Mm-hmm. I love the fact you talked about a gift for Christmas or birthdays and stuff. Cause that is perfect, but it's also a tool. Uh, we have a, um, a study guide that comes along with it. People can get, uh, for different small groups, uh, it's just so fun. I have a, a gal in my church and she um, has a high level uh, uh, women's uh, executive Bible study that she does. Mm. And she said, we're studying your book and everybody's yeah. loving this book. And so it's so fun to see men and women both uh, just relating to the book because it's real life. It's the, yes. you know, it's the real life aspects. So anyhow, there's a, there's a nine um, master classes that can come. If somebody would like to get the master classes. Mm-hmm. And uh, so if you go to the most valuable catch.com, you'll get the best price. And there's some bundles that if you'd like to have them, they're available. And we just encourage you. I to love do that. that. Great tool, great resource to have in our hands and our hearts and our lives and great leadership principles. So there's just a lot. It's a, it's a, it's a diverse book with a diverse audience for different reasons. So Go grab a copy, guys. Pastor, thank you. Thank you for just all you're doing for the kingdom of God. And uh, I, I love talking to you. Remind me of talking thank to you. my dad. It's just easy to talk to you. You have such a pastor's heart. It comes through so strong and clear talking to you and your love for people and to see people developed and to see people not miss out on yes. the adventure of serving the Lord. It is an adventure. It's going to feel risky at times, guys. We're not going to lie to you. Um, but with great risk comes great reward, not just on right. in heaven, but here on earth to know you're That's living right. the life that God has called you and equipped you and, and designed you to live. We want to be living the life that he created works in advance for you to do. Um, so dig, you know, dig into that, lean into that, trust God, trust his plan for your life. So thank you, pastor. Thank you for your thank time. You. 
My privilege. Thanks for having me today. You're so welcome. And I would love for you to pray of our listeners, especially anyone who just feels like, okay, I really want to hear those prompts, stay available, hear from the Lord. Let's just close this time just praying for those that have heard this conversation today. Amen. Thank you. Lord, I do thank you for every person that you are bringing into contact with this message. And I pray for them, Lord. I ask God that you would meet them. Some of them are desperate today. Some of them are lonely. Some of them feel like they've made too many mistakes. They they wonder if you could love them or really do anything with them. So today, by faith, God, we just pray the power of your Holy Spirit over every situation, over every heart. And I pray that today there would be the lifting power of your spirit, that Christ would be seen as our loving God who speaks, who loves, who comes to cleanse and redeem, to lift us up and to move us forward for his glory. So God, let victory come. Encourage today. May big decisions be made to trust you. And God, may people be surprised with how near and close you are. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks for joining the conversation. If you've been inspired to make life matter, share a review and subscribe at cpnshows.com or anywhere you listen to podcasts so you don't miss an episode. Connect with me at angeladenadio.com, Facebook at Angela Donatio VOV, and Instagram at Angela Donatio. Until next week, let's make life matter.